All right, I think it looks good. So welcome, we finally made it to class. Yeah. Uh, the uh, winter storm wasn't too bad, but the university felt the need to cancel anyway. So hopefully y'all watch the syllabus video. If not, it's on Blackboard. Um, there's uh, some information there and also in this one that'll be on this week's weekly quiz. So uh, the way this works, as you saw from the syllabus video, is that we have the regular weekly quizzes. They're multiple choice and some problems, fill in the blank and so on, numerical answers on Blackboard each week. And I take the exam from those. And so whenever it comes to exam time, study those carefully. Uh, the way you study a multiple choice uh, to figure out what I'm gonna put on the exam is always also look at the ones that weren't the right answer because you need to think, how would he ask this if B was the right answer? And so on. So that's a, those multiple choice ones are vocabulary quizzes, basically. So you can look to see all those words. Now, of course, sometimes there's joke answers on there too. So I mean, be reasonable. But, but for the most part, uh, that's a good way to study. Uh, the numerical problems are going to be pretty straightforward. Um, someone asked a good question. I think I posted it on Blackboard about, about uh, the composition notebook. You know, I don't take those up. I don't check those or anything like that. I just find it's good to, to practice with the game ball. So if on the test, you're going to need a pencil and a calculator and your brain to do a problem, it's probably best to only practice with that. Um, you can copy that and put it in some electronic tablet software or whatever that you want to use. That's great. But it's also good to have something that, that doesn't pop up with notifications all the time when you're trying to do your homework. And so that's a good thing about composition notebooks. It's a little bit old school, but I think it works. Okay, so let's jump into today. So today we're going to be talking about basic statistics and we're going to do a measurement exercise. And so there'll be some, some fun games we play with this, uh, with these rulers, but let's start out. Why do we want to think about quality assurance and quality control? And in, especially in a forensic situation, it's about trust. So society in general and the legal system in particular, and the prosecution and the defense, they all have to depend upon your data and your analyses. And so there's a huge uh, body of, of uh, agencies and trainings and, and uh, procedures and, and all kinds of things guaranteeing trust in your results, okay? So expert testimony must be based upon scientific facts or data and reliable principles and methods. And then those methods applied reliably to the facts of the case. So you see that it's just building this pyramid of trust. And quality assurance, QA, defines what conditions will yield reliability. So those are things like having trained staff in the laboratory, having standard operating procedures that are published and well known and can be inspected by other agencies or other labs. And then without statistics, there can be no quality management or assurance. So the statistics down at the level of your data is your, the typical statistics you've already experienced, like standard deviation, finding the mean, and those kinds of things. So today we're going to focus on those statistical values that allow us to evaluate whether your data is precise, whether it's accurate, whether it's reliable. And so this is sort of this layered structure of quality assurance. We're not going to go through every one of these, but you have external organizations, kind of like those things that were in that first video uh, called the operating, uh, the scientific uh, committees uh, for forensic science. Uh, there's a committee on everything from fingerprints to uh, lab instrumentation. Then you have professional organizations uh, like Ask Lab. So they're... Uh, accrediting bodies that come through the forensic lab and check their procedures, check their equipment, check their uh, maintenance logs and so on, and the training of their employees to make sure that they are trustworthy. Then in, internally to the forensic laboratory, you have uh, instrument logs, control charts, and this whole semester we're gonna be focusing on that activity of control charting. <clears throat> I've already seen a few people put their uh, their data suggestions in the spreadsheet, so that's good. Follow that link that's in Blackboard and put your name and the data that you want to track this semester. But what are some ideas of some of the data that people are tracking? Who's excited about their data source? No one wants to. We've had some really strange ones. Uh, one, one person 
uh, she had to walk her dog every morning. And so she, she set up an operational definition as to when she would start the stopwatch and when she would stop it. And it was how long her dog took to find a spot. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, as they left the house, he hit it, and then you know, it would be fine. And I realized it takes you know about thirty-five seconds on average for this dog to find a spot to pee. So now I know all about her dog, you know. <laughs> but then it was very easy on the control chart, and then it would be way out, like three minutes. And and so in the the analysis log, she said, you know, there was another neighbor walking across the sidewalk on the other side of the street, and the dog had to bark for two minutes, you know, and then it decided to do its business. So uh, definitely something unique happened that day. And that's the point of a control chart. You know, if you're tracking uh, the, the lab sample every day just to make sure that your instrument's working well, uh, what you want to do is you want to see the behavior over time of that instrument when it's operating normally. So that when something's abnormal, you see an out of control point. Okay. So be thinking about what you're going to analyze. So let's review. Let's get down into the numbers. And let's talk about something that we covered in freshman chemistry and probably your high school chemistry. And that is significant figures. Okay. <clears throat> and so here are the rules for significant figures. The leading zeros are only there to tell you where the decimal point is. Okay. They're not significant. They're just... Uh, sort of a place marker. And so leading, leading zeros are not significant. So in this number, we have two significant figures. Those zeros in front of those numbers are not significant. And we know that because if you were to write this in scientific notation, you would get rid of those. You would write it 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3. And that 1.2, those are your significant figures. Okay. Now with the decimal place, trailing zeros are significant. So in this particular number, we have four significant figures because that's telling you the level of precision we have. So 1.200 is telling you that you know that that third decimal place is zero, okay? Or that's your, your extra digit. You really, the first three are your certain digits and your last one is your uncertain digit. So it might be a zero in that third place. It might be one or, you know, but it's, um, that's your measurement. That last digit would be the one that varies, hopefully. And then captive zeros are significant. So you see, you see we're, our first three uh, rules are governing what to do with zeros. Of course, a captive zero is going to be significant. Why would, what would you do if you were trying to get rid of that one? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so both of these, uh, the 1.200 and then the second one, uh, they have four significant figures. I've underlined the significant figures. And then never append zeros without justification. Uh, so... Um, if you measured at 1.2 and you were, say, subtracting a number that had three decimal places, adding those extra zeros, you may do that for the subtraction, but uh, it's, not, it's not your final answer. You wouldn't leave those, those zeros on there. You would round them off. Now, multiplication and division rules, you retain the least number of significant figures. And so if you have 11 times 0.05, you would round that last one to one significant digit because the 0.05 only has one significant digit. So you would round that to 0.6. And then subtraction and addition retain the least number of decimal places. <clears throat> so in this case, the 11 has zero decimal places. And so I'm uncertain. Remember that that last significant figure is your digit of uncertainty. So if I have 11 and I don't have any decimal place or anything like that, I'm really saying I have 11. It could be 12. It could be 10. Right? I, I'm uncertain in that, that one's place. How am I going to know if I subtract 0 0.05? You see, it's about knowledge. If I'm uncertain in the ones, I cannot be certain in the hundredths. Okay. So that's what, don't think of these significant uh, figure rules as mere rules. Think about them in terms of uncertainty. Because when we start getting our standard deviation, we're going to use that as our uncertainty. And it's going to, it's going to help us decide where to round. Okay. We use these significant figure conventions when we have no idea what the true uncertainty is. I've been using one plus or minus one in the uncertain digit as my default, okay? But after we do an experiment, we have multiple uh, measurements, and then we have a standard deviation, that's our measurement of uncertainty. It might be plus or minus three, or it might be plus or minus eight. Then we know the uncertainty and we can write it. But this is, this, this is what you use when you have no idea what the uncertainty is. This is a default. And it may be not good enough, right? If we just have plus or minus one in that last digit, 
Uh, that may not be uh, accurate. We might actually be less certain than that. And so let's do some examples. Okay, so this, uh, with, let's, let's start with the one that seems to confuse most people, and that is this uh, addition and subtraction rule, okay? So let's take, um, I'll do this in scientific notation because that's the one that's in the notes. So I'll say 2.3 times 10 to the minus two, and I'm gonna subtract 1.1 times 10 to the minus three. Okay, I find it best to convert these all to decimal places, okay? And so how will we get 2.3 times 10 to the minus 2? That's going to be 0 0.023. And this one is going to be 0 0.0011. Now it's a little bit more obvious how I'm going to do subtraction, okay? Uh, I feel bad for you if you're doing stuff like times 10 to the minus 9, times 10 to the minus 10, but <laughs> that's that's the best way to do it because uh, you're never going to make a mistake if you do it that way. Of course, you can use your calculator if you're on the exam, but um, most people I find when they're using their calculator screw up the powers of 10 a lot of times, and so you may want to check it by hand since you're going to have plenty of time. All right, so how do we do this subtraction? I'm going to have to put, I do this, I put a dashed line right here by the least uh, certain number. So this 0 0.023, that, that three, that, that's the thousandth place, that's the limit of my certainty. Okay, that's my uncertain digit for the first number. And so I'm going to have to round the result at that point. So this one, no matter what it is, is going to disappear because I'm certain in the thousands, not in the ten thousands. I'm going to put a zero here so I can do the subtraction. So 10 minus one is nine. This has become a two. Two minus one is one. And then bring the two down. Zero point. Okay. All right. And then this dashed line here tells me where to round. And so I'm going to round that result. I've got a I've got a nine here, so I'm going to round that back up to zero point zero two two. And that's my result. Any questions about that? Okay, so there's one of those on the homework, very very straightforward. Okay. Let's go ahead and do the math on this one here. This was 11 times 0 0.05, okay? So that's gonna be 0 0.055, okay? That's the result of that multiplication, but then I have to round this to one significant figure. So that's where it becomes, um, um, did I make a mistake here? I might have. So we're going to round this to one significant figure. And so this is going to be, oh, no, it's, I'm sorry. Zero point five five. Okay, so I'm going to round this to one significant figure. So I'm going to round this up. Okay, so that's going to be the point six. So that's where the point six came from. All right. <clears throat> So any questions on these? Okay. Let's get into something a little more interesting. Okay. Let's look at some of the statistical terms. Okay. So these are some definitions, some vocabulary that we use here in the course. There's a difference between a sample and a population. And when we're taking the mean, we're going to use these these uh, various designations for the mean. So if it's a sample, that means a small number of observations, so in less than uh, 15. So we'll use X bar or this uh, angle bracket X. Those would be the mean for a sample. So when you see those symbols, we're dealing with a sample. And I'll try to be consistent with that in my notes. Now, when we're dealing with more than 14 measurements, 15 or more, then we use the Greek character mu. Okay, so this is indicating that we have a population. Now when we're dealing with standard deviation, we're going to use S when we have a sample, and we're going to use sigma, the Greek character sigma for a population. So these are 
issues of communication. If you're going to write to me uh, what your mean is from a number of data points and you use X bar, I know that you've got at least less than 15 measurements. Okay, so it is about communication. It's not just uh, being picky. It's, it's how we communicate to people. That's the same thing, too, with the significant figure rule, too. If I were to take, let's see, let's say I were to weigh three parts. They're really small. It's probably not going to be good to weigh individually if it's really small down at the limits of my balance, and I'm going to weigh them out, and they come out on my four-place balance to, um, let's see, where's my pen? All right. So they come out to 0. Um, 0, 0.0100 0, 0 grams. Okay, so that's the mass for three parts. <clears throat> Four place balance, you guys have used them in the lab, no problem. What's the mass for a particular part? Okay, can't really tell any difference between the two, so I'm going to divide this by three. So divide this by three. Now three is a counting number. It has no uh, uncertainty associated with it. So it's what we call an exact number. So I'm not dividing by something that has one significant figure. Counting numbers have an infinite significant uh, figure. So they don't limit the, the significant figures. So what's this going to be? It's gonna be 0 0.0033. But if I put that on my calculator, it goes on forever, doesn't it? How many decimal places do I keep? So we got two or three. Do I keep all of them though? No. All right, so up here I've got three, three significant figures. I'm gonna keep three here, okay? I'm gonna throw those out, okay? Grams each. The, what we see occasionally is when people keep all of those decimal places, it's not just a mathematical mistake, it's a communication error, okay? If you keep, I don't know, let's say you kept, uh, one, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you kept out to here, right here, because you have an eight place calculator, okay? You're telling somebody that your balance can weigh out to, this is milligrams, this is micrograms, so 0.1 micrograms. You know how expensive that balance would be? <laughs> You're telling somebody that you have the world's most precise balance, okay, just by keeping the number of digits that you kept. So you're miscommunicating. And so that's what this is about, is communicating where your uncertainty is. Okay. And so that's what we also communicate when we use mu versus x or sigma versus s. So in your control chart, we're going to collect data for three weeks, get to 15 points before we calculate our standard deviation and our means. And so we're going to use mu and sigma in our reports and all of those things because we will have a population. So let's use those Greek characters. Okay, okay here are the, the, the calculations or the formulas for the standard deviation. There's a slight difference between the sample and population standard deviations. And that is this n minus 1 down here in the denominator, okay? So we're really dividing by what's called the degrees of freedom. And now these are different degrees of freedom than, than we have in PCHEM. In PCHEM we were talking about rotational, vibrational, and translational degrees of freedom. It's, it's mathematically, it's connected through... Uh, the, the freedom you have in the, in the numbers, okay, um, it's just in a molecule, there's three things it can do. Here, once you take the mean, you, you need two data points to take the mean. And so essentially we re reduce the degree of freedom by one by taking the mean. And in this, this particular prob uh, problem, it uses the mean here. And so we're reducing the degrees of freedom by one in taking the mean. And, and so we're dividing by the remaining degrees of freedom to calculate the standard deviation. Let's take this formula apart, okay? We've calculated the mean, and if we put our data on a number line, you know, we might have the mean here, let's do the x bar, and we've got a data point here and a data point there and a data point there. 
And what we're doing is we're trying to calculate this deviation from the mean. You see, every data point has a certain deviation from the mean. The larger the deviations, the less precise our system. Okay, so we want to get the, the standard deviation. What is that? Well, if we were to just average the deviations, the negative ones and the positive ones would cancel each other out. So we can't have that. So that's why we square them. So we take all the deviations from the mean, we square them to make the negative ones positive. And then we just take the average. So that's all we're doing. We're squaring the deviations. You see that right here, each X data point, deviation from the mean, we square that. We add all of those up and then we divide by the number. In, in, the, in the sample situation, we divide by the number minus one. In the population situation, we just divide by the number. And then because we squared them, we want to get back out of the square. So we take the square root. So hopefully now the standard deviation makes sense to you. We're just trying to get a capture of how much the data is scattered away from the mean. And we can't have the negative ones cancel the positive ones. So we square them all, take the average, and then take the square root. Now, what about this one and n minus one and n? Okay, so you see, once we get up around 15 data points and higher, these two formulas are very similar to each other. But when we get into the lower number of observations, like five or less, you see they're quite a bit different. And this one is the larger number. Okay, so using the larger uncertainty in your reporting is what we call a more conservative estimate. Okay, it has nothing to do with politics. Okay, you're talking about giving somebody the worst case scenario. So by dividing by that smaller number, the n minus one, you have a larger estimate of your uncertainty. And so when, it, when you're dealing with a sample, that's more important to give somebody sort of the worst case scenario of your uncertainty. We'll talk about this pooled standard deviation in a minute, but this is essentially the variances. So S squared, that's another term for you. And so the pooled standard deviation, you take the weighted average of the variances So the weighted average of the variances, how is it weighted? By the number of data points in each group, okay? Minus one for each. So it's the degrees of freedom for each group, which is the number of data points minus one, and their variances added together, divided by the total number of degrees of freedom in the room, and then you take the square root to get out of the variances and into the standard deviation. So that's the, the pooled standard deviation, and we'll actually do an exercise with that here in a minute. Okay. Every measurement has some sort of uncertainty, whether it's analog or digital. And so you can see here, we've got tick marks, you know, every value, 123, 124, 125. And it's acceptable to estimate one digit beyond the tick marks on an analog readout. And so if I'm looking at this particular needle position, I'm coming up here and I'm saying it's going to be 125.5. You can, again, if it's, if it's right here, you can say maybe 0.8, you know, if it's over here, you can say 125.2. I mean, you can, you can estimate where it is in that one tick mark, but trying to get two decimal places in between there, I don't think you could do that. Okay. Are you certain about this digit? No, that's your uncertain digit. Are you certain about this one? Yes. It's definitely above 125. So that, does that make sense about which one you're certain about, which one you're not, uncertain, not certain about? And the same over here on digital balances, sometimes you see you know, this, this blinking number. And, and, and so you need to estimate, which one is it gonna be? Is it gonna be four, is it gonna be five? Okay, it's best to have uh, some sort of indicator 
as to when you take your measurements on these digital balances. We have one upstairs that hooks to a printer or we have it hooked to a Raspberry Pi where it collects the data into a text file. And as soon as the balance stops fluctuating, you know, you put a new mass on there, close the door, the balance fluctuates a little bit and the, the balance itself decides when it's a stable reading. And when it reaches that stable reading, it spits the mass out to the data port and we get it recorded on the screen. So it sort of decides whether it's four or five for us and prints it out. <clears throat> and so this uh, measurement system evaluation, when you buy an instrument, the literature with the instrument gives you an estimate of its uncertainty. Most of these four place balances, it's plus or minus two in the fourth decimal place. It's not even one. So it, the uncertainty would be 0 0.0002 grams. Okay. Uh, but you should verify that occasionally. You have these weight sets that are calibrated. You can go in and, and measure a light mass and a heavy mass and make sure it's linear and all of those kinds of things. Uh, you can verify that or, or you can control chart it, um, especially for your balances. Uh, you can work easily against a primary standard in your balances and mass is typically the foundation for all of these measurements. Because with your mass, then you can calibrate your volumetrics. You know the density of water at a given temperature, so you can fill your volumetrics up to a mark and weigh them. And you know that that, that mark has got the exact amount of water in it that it should have at that given temperature. Those cali calibrated volumetrics are then what calibrate your instruments because you come up with your standards at various concentrations and then you have a uh, calibration on it. And then those calibrated instruments will validate methods. So you've got a calibrated instrument and then you run a known through there and you see what the measurement is of that concentration and you can calculate your percent recovery. And you can say, yes, this instrument's behaving well. I put 100 milligrams per, uh, uh, milliliter, per liter in there and it came out with the right answer. <coughs> and then each of these steps affects the overall uncertainty so you need to know how to propagate uncertainty so we will learn that again too so you had to do that in pkim one had to do it in quant to some degree um, this will be the third time you see it and i typically see in education at least in my experience the third time you go through a piece of material that's when it becomes yours and so after this course, you guys will be fantastic at propagating uncertainty. Okay, I, I guarantee it. So let's do a measurement exercise to uh, practice calculating some of these values. <clears throat> We've got eight columns here, so I'm just going to create groups. So each, each column is a group. And so you're going to use these uh, measurement devices. It's a great question. I'm not going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> right? So it's, it's not a dumb question. 
It's, a great, it's actually the point. <laughs> All right, so y'all can measure and write down, and then uh, maybe maybe in your row, pick somebody that will be the, the data collector, go around and get everybody's um, measurement, okay? Yes. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> So the question was, how, what, how, how do we measure a thumb, you know, from the knuckle, from the, the webbing? Um, uh, and then is it in inches or centimeters? Okay, y'all can talk. So in your little groups, uh, y'all can figure this out if you want. It's always like, what a yell out. <laughs> <laughs> it's all glad to yell one out. <laughs> all right, for your group, tell them. Let's get back there and y'all can get up too. You move around. Somebody in the group has to collect the, the, the number of people in your group, the mean, and the standard deviation. So go ahead and calculate those. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so like I said, each group will calculate their their mean and standard deviation. I can go ahead and write down the numbers here. It's a six in the first group. Okay. Six in the second group. Third group. Six. Group four. Six. Okay, for group one, what is your mean? Yes, it's over here. For the mean? 3.75 what? Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> right? Because it could be I mean, a tiny little thumb, but still. <laughs> and your standard deviation? 0.25. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> 
will never play the saxophone. <laughs> That's right. All right, group two. Group two. 5.5. Inches? Okay. And the standard deviation? Okay. Group three? Okay. Group four? That's this group here. 14 what? Okay. Any decimal places? Okay. Okay. And standard deviation? Okay. Okay, what's the mean? I missed the first number. Um, so N is 4, and then X is the, or X is the 3.675. Inches? Uh, centimeters. Centimeters. Okay. Group 6, over here. Okay. Standard deviation? Not yet. Okay. Group 7. 13. Centimeters? Units? Centimeters or? Okay, yeah, 13 inch thumb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and eight. Um, well, I'm kind of curious. So I'm okay. For calculating standard deviations, um, are y'all familiar with the statistical functions on your calculator? They're really handy. Okay, I would I would advise you to figuring it out. I mean, not so much for the test because I only give you I think three three data points at most. If I if I'm going to have you calculate it on the test, because again it, it's the same thing. If I give you seven or eight, I'd, so might as well give you three. And but there's a typically there's like a little like a little sigma plus or sigma minus. And so uh, what you can do is you put in the data point and hit sigma plus, and then put in the next data point and hit sigma plus, and then the third data point and hit sigma plus. And then you hit mean, and it does all of the stuff behind the scenes and gives you the mean. And then you hit standard deviation, and it does all of the calculations behind the scenes and gives you the standard deviation. So it speeds things up greatly. Okay, who has a standard deviation for me? <laughs> okay. It, well, let's see. Let me look at that. Is that a? Yeah, it's not on every one of the, yeah. I mean, this has a lot of good stuff on it. It's not that nice. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's not a problem. Yeah. Like I said, with three data points, you can do it by hand. I typically do it in a table. Yes? Uh, it's group three. Okay. 0 0.83? Okay, wow. Okay. Oh, I thought you said point zero eight three. No, zero point eight three. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah point zero eight three. All of our hands are <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> The thumbnail. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? So typically we'll do it in a in a table. I'll have the data points, and then I'll have the differences from the mean, and then I'll have those squared, and then I sum them at the bottom, and then divide by n minus two. Excel does minus one time. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. Group five. What's that? Three. Okay. Quick question. Yes. If I didn't go ahead and check the online anything yet, because I've spoken to my online classes during the freeze, mm -hmm. um, am I supposed to panic immediately right now? Or no, 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 no. Jump into it. Just jump into it. It's not a problem. Okay. Yeah.
Anyone else? We're looking for group six, seven, eight, and two and four. Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Excellent. All right. Group seven. One point four. Okay. Thank you. Group six. Okay, sure. Uh, back to group two. Point two nine. Okay. Inches. Okay. And then group four. Let's see. That's this one here. One point five. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Waiting on group six. Okay, 1.2. Great, we got everybody. All right, now, what's the first thing we want to do when we have all of these in different units? Yeah, so let's uh, let's force group one and two to convert theirs real quick. Okay, <laughs> since majority rules, right, we'll say, all right. Now, now we're going to multiply yours by what number? It's a definition, yeah, 2.54. Now, that sounds like it has three significant figures, but it's a definition. So definitions don't limit your significant figures. So multiplying by 2.54 is an exact multiplica multiplication, and you would keep all of the significant figures. Let's say you had four significant figures, and you multiply by 2.54, you still have four significant figures. Does that make sense? Okay. So good. So multiply the 3.75 and everything, all four of those numbers, by 2.54. So what's this first one? Someone with quick fingers. Uh, 9.5 I'll say two centimeters. Okay, and then the 0.25? 0.635. Point okay, and then the 5.5? 5 .5. 13. And then the 0.29. <clears throat> okay, all right. So now we have all of these, and does anybody see a problem with our means? Let's just look at our means. So the first thing you do with a data set is called ANOG, which is the dumbest acronym ever. It's called Analysis of Good. <laughs> does it make sense, right? They actually taught that to me in a statistics course, and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Just look at the data and see if it makes sense, right? You don't have to give it an acronym, but ANOG. Okay, so now you've got it stuck in your head. Do we really have, Let's see, what's the smallest one? You know, like a, a, an, an eight centimeter thumb and a 14 centimeter thumb. I mean, maybe, okay. But that seems like a pretty big difference. Okay. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And so, you know, there must be something different in between the groups, okay. Look at the precision. The precisions, the standard deviations are not, that dramatically different except for this last one okay so this one's big so I'm gonna put a big question mark by that okay and that's the that's the biggest one so when if you're I like to think of this as you've got eight forensic labs and you tell them all to study a particular thing and they all do now what's the problem uh, first off with our instructions here you brought you brought it up. Could be measuring differently. What does it mean to measure a thumb? Okay, and we didn't measure a thumb. We measured forty thumbs. We measured forty different thumbs. Maybe we should have picked one thumb, and had everybody measure that same thumb. So then we would know that this different measurements wasn't related to differences in the thumbs, but actually was related to differences in how we measured. Okay. We might need to come up with what's called an operational definition, you know, the, the length of the thumb. Or we could have been measuring the circumference, you know, how fat is everybody's thumb, you know. That's measuring a thumb, too. 
So we didn't define what we were measuring. We didn't have a standard to go around and each lab measure a standard. And so we have quite a bit difference. In, and so are our results accurate? We have no idea because we have no acceptable standard reference for the thumb. Okay. Are they precise? Well, pretty precise. We've got one particular one that's, that's, that's a, I would say, an outlier. Let's look at that group's measuring devices. Hold up your measuring devices for everyone to see. Hold them high. What do y'all see is the problem? Yeah. And if you got close, there'd be different lengths. Now, they're measuring it in inches, but they're different lengths. Hold them next to each other. Like, I'll bring them up to the camera, too, so you can see closely. It's not that one is an 8-inch ruler and the other is a 12-inch ruler, okay? Um, yeah, it's that this is one inch on that one, okay? And that is one inch on the other one, okay? Oops, let me move my camera here. So you can see that one has just been stretched. And so they don't even have the same like length for one inch. Now that seems absurd, doesn't it? But that's not absurd. If you're doing a GC measurement, the retention time is a flexible axis, okay? Flow rates change, the power levels change. Lots of things change to stretch or compress your ruler. So every lab could have a different ruler. That might be okay in a sense if they run the standards on their ruler and run their unknowns on their ruler and they get the same answer as this group, okay? But in that lab, they had two of one kind of ruler and three of another kind of ruler. And so their instruments inside their lab, we detected. We identified that right away with their standard deviation, okay? So this is a way to use these statistical numbers to, to observe. Now, group to group, Okay, let's just stipulate that our thumbs are probably not that much different in length, not 14 to 8, okay? And so we might analyze group to group to see if our measurement devices are similar, and we would discover that they're not, that the people who measured 14-centimeter thumbs had a really short ruler, okay? And people that measured the 8-centimeter the thumbs had a, a long ruler, okay? So we could go group to group. But the best way to do that is with a standard reference material. And everybody measure the same exact reference material in every group. And then you would be able to do what we call a measurement system evaluation. So you're evaluating your measurement system. And that's a bedrock piece of having trust in your data. So we could also go through and do the pooled standard deviation. If we um, calculated the degrees of freedom, so we subtracted one from all of our ends, and we squared these S values. So this would be for group one, this would be S1, and this would be six minus one, and this would be S2, and that would be six minus one. And then this would be down here, six and six. And we could get a pooled standard deviation for those two groups. And so what that does is it says, well, we might have different means, but how's our precision group to group? Like, What's the precision for this whole room? We could do this for every group and say our whole room had a standard deviation of this. Okay, so that's how we would pool everybody's standard deviations. Okay, we're out of time. So this is the take home lessons. Standard operating procedures are essential and specifications. What units are we going to use? Are we measuring the length and width? How are we measuring it? And then those are called operational definitions. Do we know a true or accepted value? Do we have a standard reference material so that we could calculate accuracy? Without that, we cannot calculate accuracy. And then how reproducible are your samples or your methods or your personnel or your groups from one to another? That all falls into precision. Okay. So hopefully that was a good exercise for you. Got you thinking about things. And you get to keep the little rulers. All right. So have a great day. <laughs>